Now I'll hit record. Okay. <laughs> no, but but we're t- talking about the blessing of being on mute one time at my work, um, 400 people on the line and somebody, we were giving out prizes and somebody made a remark. They didn't know they were not on mute. And mm. they made a remark that the person who had just won the prize and they're like, ah, this whole thing is a sham. And they were caught on mute. So of course, because I'm administrating the thing, I see the name of who's doing it, who made that comment, and I called him out right then and there. And I was like, why do you think it's a sham, so-and-so? Oh, and my gosh. All of a sudden, you see her go on mute. <laughs> and I just rolled with it, and everyone laughed. And oh, that's funny. Why? It's important to know how to use your mute button. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. That's crazy. How was your day, Jim? Uh, it was good. Busy. Just a lot, a lot of stuff going on. And uh, hey, happy release day. Um, I'm not sure when this will actually air, but uh, today we released the we we released the the physical. Uh, I'm sorry, the digital editions of the player's guide, the game master guide, and your mission brief, your latest mission brief set, the trade ledgers. So, yes. might you take 30 seconds to talk about it? Okay. Well, one, I I have to say that um, I had the opportunity to work on the player's guide and the game master's guide after I had worked on the mission briefs, yeah. and and I wish I would have written the mission briefs afterwards because afterwards I was like, Oh, there's so many things I could have done even better now. Mm-hmm. But the, but the trade ledgers mission brief is great. It's the next generation era. It's full of Packlands and Orions and Ferengi. And basically what it was based on was what we've been calling spice of life games. The ones mm-hmm. that are close to home is that, okay, suppose you want to play a game where you're in the alpha and beta quadrants you know, you're not necessarily discovering new life and new civilizations all the time, but you are dealing with a lot of politics and a lot of trade negotiations and mining colonies. And so I wanted players to have the and game masters the opportunity to explore that piece of the universe. You know, if you have to head back into to Earth for a reason or head back to one of the space stations, here's an adventure you could play along the re- road. And it's a little bit more TNG, definitely a little bit more opportunity, I felt, for comedy and some interactions and politics and diplomacy and and all that so i'm very happy to, that it's out and i've already heard some positive responses from people who've been reading through it and are excited to play it so that's always exciting yeah, yeah awesome well good well again congratulations and thank you for all the hard work that you put into it um i'm excited too because i think it ties in nicely with the player's guide right because the player's guide like we, we made sure to pack in a whole bunch of new options for for player characters that aren't starfleet aren't klingons are something different like civilians merchants smugglers whatever and i think if you take that trade ledgers pdf you know that's you know free for download you -hmm. could easily create a non-starfleet crew with the new stuff in the player's guide and just go have fun and just do do like you know the smugglers in in star trek universe instead of like star wars or firefly or traveler or whatever else right so i think uh, it it just uh, you know I, i didn't plan for it to happen but it was just one of those fortuitous timings where CBS approved the final layout of trade ledgers right about the same time we were like, oh, you know what? The the physical editions of the Game Master Guide and the Players Guide are finally shipping in the UK. So let's just release these things and start, you know, getting them out to people. So it just, it just, you know, it timed out nicely. And I, I it's happy coincidence, but I love it when it happens because that just means it was a and this felt like the good week for it too, with all those Star Trek announcements we got earlier this week from wow. Viacom CBS. Wow, man, there's just so much so much star trek going on right now and i'm just excited to be in the middle of it with this uh, with this game yeah i really encourage people to to use trade letters too to complete their characters backstories there's a lot of it that has it asks you to have a character that's on your crew maybe know somebody who's in the trade ledger story and so it's a great opportunity to flesh out characters and i I can't wait um people have told me you know when they played other modules and i'm sure it's happened to you too because you write a lot of modules that sometimes we'll get to see the post uh post play reports and i actually read through all of them because i'm curious (laughs) to see where they take the direction and especially mission briefs because they're really wide open right Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so this is good so so um 
this is a perfect segue actually into our conversation today because uh, just for all of you who may this this may be your first tune in to continuing conversations we talk about everything star trek adventures rpg i'm michael dismuke i'm a freelance writer um, for modifius the star trek adventures line and i also have the privilege of being one of the uh, co-creators of continuing missions which is the number one fan site for Star Trek's RP, Adventures RPG. So if you don't get enough from Modiphius or you want um, uh, ins and outs and character sheets that aren't produced yet, you might find them on Continuing Mission, maybe, okay? And then we have Jim Johnson here, of course, who is the project manager and line editor for the Star Trek Adventures line. And um, it's been privileged. This is now our ninth episode, Jim. Wow. Um, and we went through the Game Master's Guide, and now we're going to talk about what sets the Player's Guide apart. Um, before we get into um, the chapter we're going to focus on today, though, um, why don't you talk to us, Jim, about chapters one and two? Because they're kind of similar to Game Master's Guide, but talk to us wh why why we did that, why uh, you put the same chapters, it seems like the same chapters, um, yeah. in the two different guides. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, at, at first glance, you know, somebody might look at the table of contents for the player's guide and the game master guide and say, hey, why are why are the first three chapters like pretty much identical? What's going on there? And, uh, you know, what we wanted to do, is, of course, and we talked about this in other other videos, we wanted to make sure that these two books were aimed at a specific person. Right. So either a player or a game master. But we we're also trying to target um, new people new to Star Trek and people new to Star Trek adventures. Right. Uh, not to mention, you know, maybe even the experienced game masters and the experienced players out there and the hardcore Trekkies, too. So we're trying to hit a bunch of different audiences with these books. And so I thought it was important to make sure that we we hit the key important things like wh what is Star Trek? What is Star Trek Adventures? How does the universe work in a game context? And then what are the errors of play and the styles of play that you can play? And what we did is so we, we, we set these first three chapters up with the same basic outline but we wrote them specifically to the to the person, right? So the player one, the player book, all about players. What can your characters do? What are you, what should you be thinking about as a player? How should you be preparing to walk into the game as a player? And then from the game master standpoint, we've already talked about it in the other videos, but it's like, okay, I'm a game master. How can I use the technology? How do I set up the style of play? How do I set up my era thinking as a game master? So some people might want both books, but it, I try to be very careful that you don't need them both, right? If you're a, uh, if you're a lifelong game master, like you know, like you and me, honestly, uh, all you're really going to need is the game master book, unless you want to see what kind of cool stuff the players are going to get, right? And well, I have to, like, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, I have to actually jump in there because at, the player's guide has a lot of character options. We're going to get into it, but it has yeah. a lot of things that game masters should be aware that players have the opportunity to do. It's chock mm -hmm. full of a bunch and a bunch of ideas. Yeah. I, I felt that the player's guide was a great introduction for first time role players and first time people into Star Trek. And I, I beta tested it on my 13 year old niece and my 18 year old nephew and they were like this sounds so we were sitting by the pool reading it uh, as i was beta, beta testing it and they're like we want to play and of course as you know we did end up playing yeah, so yeah. It, it's to whet the appetite of the player and make you feel confident if you're a first-time player in star trek or rpg to make you feel confident like okay i can work in this world this is kind of fun right mm -hmm. and so now we're gonna go uh is there anything you want to highlight i thought we would jump you know, do a brief on chapter one, Star Trek Defined, a brief on chapter two, the Star Trek universe in play, and then we'll start deep diving into chapter three, because there are things in there that are specific to players that they should be aware of. You okay. want to do a review of one and two? Yeah, we'll just do a quick, I'll just do a quick page through here. I got, I got it on my other screen, and I'll just do a quick page through. Uh, so important, just to note, in the introduction <clears throat> of both books, uh, but we're specifically talking about the player's guide here. So introduction, if you are uh, brand new to Star Trek or you're a casual fan or you want to get a refresher on what Star Trek is, we provide a few episodes from each series to watch just to kind of like get your brain going about what what makes Star Trek really amazingly awesome. Uh, so check out that list of episodes. Of course, you know, the Internet being what it is, there's a million billion best of Star Trek episode lists out there. You can use those, of course, if you want to. These are just the ones that we picked that we thought were kind of like a good a good mix of episodes to watch, not just because they're great Star Trek, but also because I think they really um, they really exemplify what you can do with the RPG 
right? Because mm-hmm. it gives you it gives characters characters cool things to do, and there's you know just stuff going on that you can fit into an RPG. So I sure, re- don't, don't skip the don't skip the intro. Is yeah, my, and, is my and actually, I, I want to highlight that because most stream most people have a streaming service that carries at least one of these Star Trek um, yeah. franchises uh, stories. And I remember when I had to select certain ones, like for instance, Star Trek Voyager and also Enterprise. I, I remember these. I picked ones that purposely showed not only a balance of action and science but mm-hmm. also high on the characterization drama and that improv acting that makes yep. our so fun. So, so those were some really good selections um, that we, that we put in there. Cool. Yep. So then, uh, then we jump into chapter one and this chapter one is divided into two sections. First part is top 10. What is Star Trek? Like what, what are the key, 10 key components in our opinions, not, not, not gospel, right. Uh, of what makes Star Trek, Star Trek. And then the second half of that chapter is taking that forward and saying, okay, now what is Star Trek Adventures? Why is Star Trek Adventures the world's most popular Star Trek RPG? And what what makes our Star Trek Adventures tick in relation to what is Star Trek? So we tried to blend those two together so that you understand as a player and as a game master that um, you know the Star Trek experience that you see on the screen week after week and all these great TV series that we're seeing and, and the movies, you can bring all that to your table with your friends and tell your own Star Trek stories with this game and and with all this all the cool stuff that's out there um i'll add an asterisk to that though and i will say that some of the coolest comments i've gotten about these books online so far is that these chapters uh can apply to you playing star trek with whatever game system you're using like you can use far trek you can use fasa decipher uh, uh last unicorn like well i mean whatever your favorite game system of choice because like every, every gamer's got their own favorite right if you're not using star trek adventures i don't I don't care, right? If you're using this book and you're getting some of the key concepts out of here about what makes Star Trek really cool as an RPG, and you're using this on some other random system, uh, I'm cool with that because you're playing and you're having fun and you're together with your friends doing stuff other than, you know, whatever else you might be doing, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, use the book. And uh, no matter what, like, I don't want to prestatalize about Star Trek Adventures. I think it's a great game. Uh, and I'm not just paid to say that. I just, I honestly believe it as a, as a long time Star Trek uh, gamer geek. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Anyway, so that's chapter one. Um, yeah, and um, good summation. Um, I want to, as an intro to chapter two, what I want to mm-hmm. say is something about Star Trek Prodigy that's on the air yeah. right now. Mm-hmm. One of the things that's thrilling me about Prodigy is that every episode they take a, a, a rooted foundation star trek idea maybe it's a technology maybe it's about the prime directive maybe it's about how cadets work on a starship and every episode or temporal how time sciences work Mm -hmm. every episode seems to focus and educate the person who's new to star trek because it's for children to what star trek is all about and as i've been watching that show and today i was reviewing chapter two the star trek universe in play i saw so many great comparisons because chapter two to me is all about a quick Bringing you up to speed about this universe that you're in. Yeah. So talk to us about your take on chapter two and why we put yeah. it in there. Yeah. So chapter two is uh, like we we just did not have the we did not have the page count to go into a deep dive on all the technical scientific stuff that's in Star Trek. Right. It's 55 years worth of Star Trek is out there. There are plenty of technical manuals that have been written by Michael Kuda, Rick Sternbach, the other people, everybody else. Like go buy those technical manuals because they're awesome. They're still in print. They're amazing, amazing resources. Yes, there you go. That's the that's the classic one. It's still in print. It's been 30 years. It's still in print. It's still popular. So go buy a copy, assuming you don't already have one. I've got two copies. What they're both dog-eared to, to here and there, <laughs> to here and back again. But um, anyway, so what we didn't, so we didn't have the space to do a deep dive on any of that stuff. But what we did is we gave you a primer on the society, the technology, and a little bit about Starfleet and the service protocols. And like using some of the language that makes Starfleet kind of unique. Now, you don't have to play Starfleet, of course, but uh, we wanted to throw it in there because we expect that that's probably the vast majority of the groups out there are probably playing Starfleet or Starfleet characters. Um, But we wanted to give you an opportunity to like get the basic gist of how does a transporter work? How does warp drive work? How do shields work? But not just how do they work, but like how do they work in the game context, right? Like what can a player expect this technology to do? What can a game master expect the technology to do? And as a game master, how can you break it to challenge your player characters, right? Because it's not, it, it, there's always something happening to the transporter or to the engines or the, something else to challenge the characters. So uh, we wanted to just give everybody like a baseline understanding of all the stuff that makes the settings u- uniquely Star Trek. 
And I encourage players who read through this, yeah. have a fundamental knowledge of the technology. Don't get rooted that there's a whole bunch of rules around it because I can prove a million, uh, not a million, that's an exaggeration, dozens of Star Trek shows where transporters operate on different rules or force fields operate on different rules. And, and we're a yes and game. We've talked about that in other other stories. But by having a basic fundamental understanding of what the machine works, you get a cop an opportunity for your character to shine and say, hey, we're going to use this in an innovative way. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's been done on a show or not. It doesn't matter. You came up with the idea. So there's enough information in there as a springboard to get super creative and come up with some fun techno babble solutions to problems in the game. So that's why I think players should have a general idea of what a replicator or a transporter or a warp drive does, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it's like it's like any RPG, right? Like if you're playing... Dungeons and Dragons versus Champions versus uh, Marvel superheroes. There's a certain amount of language for that setting that you need to learn to understand, so that you're you're able to communicate with your players and with the game master and actually tell the story because you're you're setting yourself in a different universe than the one you live in, mm -hmm. and that's the same. The same is true for Star Trek, right? There, there's certain things in Star Trek that we don't have yet in the real world, right? <laughs> so right. It, it just helps to have a little bit of the language so that as you're playing as your character you are making it a little closer to what you see on the screen so don't exactly. feel like you need to memorize it but it's really useful to have those details good good all right good so that was a great summation of chapter one and two yeah. now we do need to deep dive on chapter three because this is where things really change from the game master's guide and mm -hmm. the power of the rest of the book starting at chapter three is really enabling players to just open up the treasure trove of imagination when it comes to working in the Star Trek universe. We did have a previous recording that Jim and I did about eras of play and styles of play. So you can catch that on um, Studio Timbo, the podcast, or you can catch that at Continuing Missions where we list if you, if you just do a search for continuing conversations, you're going to see that there's a game master's guide about eras of play, um, which is going to be very similar. Um, so if you want to add something about that, Jim, that's fine. But I think where it really deviates is it starting at styles of play. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I would agree because because the advice we give is very different. Uh, yeah. So the, the first the first chunk of the chapter is, is talking about the eras of play. I'll just do a quick summation here. Um, this is not you know, official Viacom CBS. This is just me and the writers kind of like wrapping our heads around the enormity of the Star Trek timeline and trying to break it down into chunks that are kind of um, not only kind of mapped to the different series, but also tell kind of like broad strokes kind of stories. So we broke it down into six, you know, chunks, most of which map to a series, but also just because Star Trek by its nature uses time travel and alternate universes and um, you know, more than one series touches on all these different eras of play. Um, so what this is important for you as a player, though, is at your session zero with your game master and your fellow players, you're going to be talking about what era do you want to play in. And if you're not super familiar with Star Trek, this will give you kind of a primer on what those eras of play are, because you're talking about like a thousand years worth of in setting, you know, content and, and each era has a different feel and like different adversaries and, and different story potentials that you can tell. And it, each one has a kind of, you know, like its own feel. Uh, so it's important to kind of like just be familiar with those. So that when you get, when your group decides what era do we want to play in, do we want original ser series? Do we want next gen, you know, dominion war, far future with discovery, you know, what do we want to do? This will give you just some common language to, uh, to talk about. Right. And once you decide on the era, you can go back to that introduction and start watching some episodes that, represent that era so now you get yeah. the visual mental picture of oh okay i get what's going on here i mean honestly the, when marvel rpg was big there was no show to reference about stuff with eras and such and so the fact that we can actually do that now with an rpg and say hey go look at the world you're going to be existing in mm -hmm. mind-blowing mind-blowing <laughs> right um so so now styles of play again this is where this really deviates from the game master's guide mm -hmm. um and I'll highlight where the deviation is just in case uh, as a game master, they haven't noticed it because maybe they only read the game master's guide or they're just wa curiously want to know what the difference is. Yeah. And what I caught as the two main differences to myself is that this one services the player so that if they're going to choose a particular type of campaign style, and we've talked again about the styles, like whether it's going to be admiral, uh, you know, they're going to be a bunch of admirals on a space station. If they're going to be, far from home, like in Voyager, you know, and not able to get back anytime soon, if they're going to be like on Enterprise doing diplomatic missions, 
it actually gives suggestions on focuses and values that people could use. So that's the first thing it gives. It says, okay, let's tailor your character a little bit for the setting that your game group has chosen. So that was the number one difference that wasn't in the Game Master's Guide. The second difference is we talk specifically to the players saying, hey, are you playing um, a command officer? Are you one of the main officers? Are you a junior officer or are you a civilian? And we ask a lot of questions, depending on their setting, to help them form the world that they're going to live in. And, and um, I had the privilege of writing a lot of this, and I purposely wrote it in question form yep. so that if a player is going through here and asking the questions, they can actually, by the time they're finished, really round out the life path on their mm -hmm. character. Right. What, what what was your take on this chapter? Yeah, I mean, that's that was it really is, is I, I really challenged you and your and the other writers. Right. To say, look. We did the Game Master chapter aimed directly at the Game Master. That's great. That's exactly what we needed. Now we need to take that same basic framework because we're talking about the same styles of play. We're just, we need to change the focus now to the player. And, and, and you need to write your, your, your sections specifically toward a player. Like imagine you're sitting across the table from a player and you want to tell them like, you know, we're walking through the life path, walk them through these questions. I love that you ask a lot of questions in your in your chapter i had fun edit, editing it because it's like oh yeah these are great questions i think i even added more while we were going so i really really tried to drive home that we wanted to to maximize the player value out of this chapter and have it aimed directly at them and i think the the section on focuses and values i thought that was really important because one of the pieces of feedback we've gotten consistently over the last four years is is that a lot of players um who aren't familiar with this kind of more narrativistic game were really struggling to come up with a list of focuses and a list of values because unlike previous Star Trek RP, there wasn't a gigantic list of skills to, to, to pick from, right? Or to check the boxes or whatever. It was like, you get, you got six focuses, make them up, whatever you want. Literally, you can literally come up with anything. It's not like you need a checkbox in warp dynamics. You can just make it up as a focus. You can do anything. Yeah. And I think a lot of people were, or are hesitant about that because we don't provide them one gigantic, you know, list of 300 focuses, right? We, we, we sprinkle them throughout all the books, right? The core book and all the division books and stuff. And so for this, because I knew we were talking about those eight specific styles of play, you know, we, 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 we worked out, it was probably as a group, I don't, I'm not going to take all the credit for it, obviously, but uh, it was like, okay, why don't we give them like three to five focuses that are relevant to that specific style of play and then let's give them a top 10, uh, you know, a top 10 list of, of values, because even values are challenging for people to, to like understand what is a value. And, um, and so we do that for every one of these, um, every one of these styles of play. And, and as a player, I hope it's helpful because uh, it gives you an immediate jumping off point to say, oh, yeah, I can, I can. In fact, you can even pull a couple, use a couple right off the list and then maybe tweak a couple for your specific character circumstances. So. Um, that is and just I, one of the places, like you said, where we really focus this directly right at the player. Yeah. And I ask that as players read through this, um, you know, we, we live in a society where we quick read everything, yeah. but as players read through this, it's all about forming a depth of, uh, a depth to your character and a reality to it. Mm -hmm. So that as you go through and answer the questions, when you come to that game, you're going to be convinced of your own backstory. Mm -hmm. and convinced of your own role and mm -hmm. and there's a lot of these side boxes this is probably one of the most side box rich chapters i think it's one of our long, longest chapters too yeah. where if you once you picked your era of play and the style of play you can go through here and get some really good thought-provoking questions one of the things we added also um i was able to write um was different inserts from the viewpoint of actual characters. There's some Easter eggs in here. I'm not going to ruin it, <laughs> but to, to kind of give examples, we put examples and you always encourage us, Jim, grab stuff from actual canon so that if they right. ever want to go back and watch the episode, they get an idea of these concepts. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, nothing else to add there. Uh, should we just talk briefly about each of the eight, just to give them like a high level overview? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you, you can certainly go back and watch the, the game master's, guide video about this chapter but uh, let's just briefly um these are in alphabetical order so there's no order of precedence or preference um i think the first one just alphabetically is admiralty campaigns which i think might be one of the more challenging styles of play to play especially if you're not familiar with star trek like would you really want to play an admiral your first time out i don't know I mean, it'd be a fun challenge probably 
But uh, for those gaming groups and players that want to play at a higher level than a captain of a ship or, or a crew on a ship, and you want to be an admiral of an entire sector, maybe uh, this is an option where you can be the admiral and your other players are your assistants or your adjutants or even captains of their own ship. And you, you kind of like change the scale of the game a little bit. Uh, a lot of different problems and challenges. Go ahead. I could actually see matching this to the video game, the one with Fleet Command. I, oh, if, yeah. if, I, if I was playing Fleet Command, the video game, I haven't played it. I've, I you know tinkered with it years ago. But say I was playing Fleet Command, I would actually, and I want to add RPG to it, I would use admira Admiralty. See, I can't pronounce it. Say it for me. Admiral Admiralty. level. <laughs> Admiralty. How about Admiral level campaign? That works too. <laughs> I, would, I would actually take an Admiral level campaign and say, okay, now that we've decided on some politics behind or an RPG, let's go jump online and start playing Fleet Command and, and fight it out and see what happens. That would be kind of a cool way to mix video and RPG. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so anyway, so so for those of you who want an experience playing something other than a captain at an even higher level, check out Admiralty Campaigns. We provide a lot of advice in here. Uh, next is uh, Close to Home, uh, Political Campaigns and Core Worlds. So there's a, a certain amount of uh, uh, TNG uh, to this. Uh, uh, Next Generation, you know, even though they, they were stretching the envelope in plenty of episodes, there was a lot of times where they were really kind of like close to home in the alphabetic quadrant, especially once the whole wharf um, subplot got going with Picard being his chadich and then them getting embroiled in the in the political under inner struggle of the Klingon Empire, it, and it seemed like they spent a lot of time in like the core Federation worlds doing stuff with the Klingons and the Romulans and you know just trying to deal with that as well as occasionally going out beyond the borders and encountering new life and new species. So yeah. And we talk about yeah. how that changes also, again, the values, because now the values might surround things like home, family, politics, things that people who are way out on the edges of the galaxy may not have to deal with as much. And so the values may change because of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. A good example, uh, you know, DS9 was pretty much uh, close to home because they were at Bajor more often than anything else. And, and the things that happened on the station or on Bajor they didn't just go away at the end of the episode, right? They were there for you next time to deal with. It's like, it was just recurring issues and challenges, you know, and you couldn't necessarily escape them because, you know, Cisco being the, being the emissary and the commander of the station, like he had that whole stuff going on. It's like, oh, I can't escape this. I'm the emissary. Oh yeah. So one episode, you know, people are, but Jordans are coming up to him and asking for his blessing. And, you know, maybe there's a visiting admiral, like, what are you doing? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like a, a challenging uh, character moment. So, uh, I could uh, see this playing of character if, if I had players who were more into like drama and romance and relationships and all on a station, maybe they're <laughs> friends. I would totally go with this type of game, you know, yeah, where yeah. constantly those relationships are growing and changing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next, we have uh, uh, deep space exploration games, and this is almost. Uh, I think the intent here was it's almost like Voyager in reverse. Where instead of you being way the heck, and that's actually a different uh, uh, style of play, is being far from home and then coming back. But this is deep space where you're you're starting in the core worlds and you're heading out into the great unknown. Of course, space is really big. There's plenty of new stuff to explore, and so this is like taking you away from the well familiar stuff of the Alpha and Beta quadrants and going off and, and like literally creating, blazing your own trail, creating your own stuff. This could be like the Enterprise era where everything is new and you have no backup. Or it's uh, you know next gen DS9 or even an original series where you're out there pushing the frontier, don't really have a lot of resources behind you to help you. You don't have a starbase you can stop off at every you know other session or whatever. Uh, you're really just exploring deep space and new things. It's an opportunity for science and exploration and discovery and lots of new uh, new species and first contacts. Yeah, and there's an inset box on page 77 which talks about the difference between Federation. Deep space yeah. missions and Klingon deep space missions, which sure. are totally different. No way do they have the creature comforts of a of yeah. a Federation ship. So if you're playing rough and tumble, um, there's a lot of suggestions about how to adapt that. And then yeah. I remember um, it always saddens my heart to think about this tragic story. But we talked about non Starfleet missions too. There's a lot of Federation ships that aren't aligned with Starfleet, meaning mm -hmm. that maybe you're a civilian from Earth, you're a scientist, and you find a way to purchase or rent or borrow a spaceship to go on your own mission. That happens in Star Trek a lot. And I wrote about, um, as an example, uh, Seven of Nine's parents. That's what they did. They were affiliated with the Federation, but they were researching the Borg be before 
the Borg even came into contact with yeah. uh, Jean-Luc Picard and TNG. And we see that backstory played out in Voyager. So you may decide that, hey, you know what? I don't want to be, I, our team doesn't want to be on, our group doesn't want to be star fleet, but we want to be scientific explorers and have an adventure from there. So we give guidance here about how to play that type of mission as a player. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next is uh, what I was just alluding to, Far From Home Games. This is where your Voyager pushed 75,000 light years away from home, or you are otherwise, you know, transported far, far, far away from home. And uh, the theory is either you're trying to head back home or you're trying to create a new life for yourself and your crew or whatever else. Maybe you're on a sleeper ship heading somewhere. And like, cause it, like it doesn't, you don't have to be Starfleet. It could be Klingon. It could be a non, non-aligned uh, crew. Uh, so it's just those concepts of um, you are the, uh, what, what is it? The uh, the fish out of water, right? You are at, completely out of your element. You are the aliens, and you are literally on your own. And how does that impact your characters? How does that impact your crew? How does that impact your values? Right? Your your whole like if you're Starfleet and suddenly you're seventy five thousand light years from home with no expectation of getting back to Earth ever. What does that do for you as a person? Like you're Janeway and you've left your fiance and your dog 75,000 light years away from home, you may never see them again. How does that impact you as a character, right? Yeah, uh, and I'm dying to see if anybody picks up the Easter eggs I wrote on page 82. Um, <laughs> I had two characters, uh, Luson Icheb and Captain Kolar, make statements about being stranded far from home. And I'm wondering if anyone could pick the, the episodes those characters are from. <laughs> um, so again, adding more perspective to it. I think one of the things that broke my heart writing this um, section, Jim, were the questions that senior officers have to be confronted with. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned them again about like, are you sticking with the prime directive or not? But also junior officers and civilians, you know, if you're choosing to play a, a far from home campaign, dive into the drama. Don't be just like, okay, we're here now. There's a lot of questions to a- answer. And mm-hmm. so those questions are laid out here in this chapter so that you can help round out your character and get into the emotions mm-hmm. of this particular situation. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Great, great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, next, uh, we've got Spice of Life games, and this is pretty much the the potpourri, right? This is the cornucopia of uh, Star Trek. A little bit of everything, session after session, episode after episode. You throw all kinds of stuff in here. Have fun with it. Do different things. We see this all the time on original series, next gen, uh, lower decks. It's always something a little different, right? This this is where you can get away with, um, you know, if you're doing a series or a campaign that's not quite as serialized as DS9 or Discovery or even Picard. You know, you can just you, you can mix it up. You can you can have have fun and play with it and do different things. And a lot of the focuses too, as mentioned in on the box on page 87, a lot of the focuses can be a little bit more toned down. Like, like you could be more about law or teaching or diplomacy or any of the sciences, because you could have what could be considered a boring job. Maybe you're a waste management specialist because Mm -hmm. that's what you do. You're in the interior of the Federation. Um, And so it gives you a little, that to me would be kind of fun. It's like, what's the people who choose to live on earth and stay on earth? What do they do for a living? Well, you know, what do they do all day long? That was there. And then there's this inset box from seven of nine, my favorite character in all of Starfleet, where she, she adds her own perspective as to uh, what she feels about the Federation. This is my take on what I think she would have feel, felt when she gave, got back in 2378. So that was a fun chapter to write. Mm-hmm. Nice. Uh, next, we got the station based games, and this can be aqua, equally applicable to stations, whether they're in, in space, deep space, or if it's a, a planetary outpost or a um, you know relay station, like whatever, anything that's not specifically a ship. And for the most part, stations generally stay in one place, right? They might orbit a planet or a location, but generally stations are too big to like independently move around. So uh, there's just different opportunities. I mean, we clearly see this on. Uh, on DS9, there's an opportunity to tell very different types of stories than if you're just warping off to the next thing week after week. Uh, so just the different challenges, different opportunities, and uh, we try to cover a lot of different stuff in there. Yeah, and that could be life. for people who are lovers of Babylon 5 or the love boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either of those kind of campaigns can, can work. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I will know because you, you're fond of noting the sidebars. We have a nice sidebar in here about... Uh, Klingon star bases and colonies, because uh, why not, right? That's just something to uh, keep in mind. Klingons, uh, you know, manage their star bases a little differently. And I, I can't remember, I'm, I'm pretty sure we dropped a reference in here to the Shackleton Expanse, 
into uh, Narendra Station. But if we didn't, I'll just mention that the Narendra Station is a, a joint Klingon Federation space station uh, highlighted in the Shackleton Expanse campaign guide. Uh, so if you need uh, more ideas for for where to set your game, check that out if you have an opportunity and if yeah. you have any uh, interest. And I want to encourage people because I know I'm hearing a lot of like, people are like, I want to play a Klingon campaign. I want to play a Klingon campaign. Yeah. Okay, maybe maybe the group can't commit to a fully Klingon campaign, but there's so many opportunities where there's an officer exchange program and you could run an entire one story um, with your officers being on a Klingon ship and get that flavor if you want to. And that could happen at a Klingon starbase or colony that maybe your ship has to dock at and mm -hmm. interact with that. So there's some good opportunities with your imagination here. Yeah. And then I think the, uh, uh, you know what, we missed one uh, somewhere along the way. I think I must have skipped it. Uh, there's a one about cinematic camp, cinematic, cinematic campaigns or cinematic experiences. Mm -hmm. And this is where you're, you're kind of going for the, um, you're going for the movie experience as opposed to like the TV experience. Cause like, obviously when you're on the big screen, you need bigger stories, bigger villains, bigger things to happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, the characters progress differently between movies versus, uh, TV episodes. So like if you wanted to, you know, promote your character and you didn't want to explain why you just want them to show up and they're suddenly a commander or whatever, then the movie style campaign really kind of works for that. Um, so just, you know, briefly, if you want to do more of the, you know, the big bang pew pew kind of stuff that you yeah. see in uh, Star Trek two, even Star Trek six, um, uh, you know, first contact. Um, this is an opportunity to do that where instead of doing a long extended campaign, you're doing a short, sharp, action packed, exciting. Well, it doesn't always have to be action packed, but, you know, usually it's spectacle more than anything else for, for the big movies. Uh, any yeah. thoughts on movies before we jump in? No, I was going to say, to me, a vil in any movie, there's a villain. There's a major villain in, in yeah. any action science fiction movie. So I think this is a chance where you can really, as a player, take risks with your characters, meaning like what's going to be the dramatic change on this hero's journey? It's that hero's journey uh, encapsulated in a two hour framework. And so, you know, whether it's lose an arm or lose a family member or gain a superpower. Yeah. Players have to be a little bit more risky in a cinematic blockbuster one, like data died in one, you know, data died, Spock yeah. died in a yep. cin that's taking way bigger risks in a movie than you're going to see in an episodic one. So if mm -hmm. you do want to give some space to the characters to really take some risks, then sign up for a blockbuster cinematic campaign. Yeah, for sure. Uh, finally, the, I, I know these are, this is one of your favorites, uh, unsanctioned missions. This is, uh, you know, Picard session 31. This is uh, getting into the, like the little dark side of the Star Trek universe that we see in some episodes and, and you know, uh, DS9 and such uh, where, you know, things, things aren't so clean and, you know, peaceful. It's uh, there's some dark stuff going on. And so uh, yeah, you wrote yeah. this. Why don't you talk a little bit about it? Man, I, I, I never thought I would be so much into Star Trek's unsanctioned missions, meaning the vigilantes of Star Trek, the Maquis, the Fenris Rangers, Picard and his troop, Prodigy. Mm -hmm. These are all unsanctioned missions, meaning the, what's it, you know, Starfleet probably comprises 1%, if not less, of the population of the entire galaxy. So what's the other 99% of the galaxy doing? And that's <laughs> what this chapter is about, is let's yeah. bring those stories to light. Some things that were really fun to write in here is like, why are you unsanctioned? What's, your, what's the motivating factor of your uh, cadre of folks you've pulled together from disparate edges of the galaxy and pockets and underworld to come together? What's the driving motivation? So that's something that the game master in session zero should really discuss with the players. And then we talk about establishing things that you don't normally need um, in a, in a Starfleet or Klingon mission, you got to have contacts, you got to have starships, you got to have access to weapons and technology. And because it's not like you can walk into a store and get these things. So you have to build a lot of, a little bit more backstory into these characters. One of the funnest parts I had though, was the box you asked us to write on page 95 about the focuses and values, because this is where all of a sudden you're dealing with the sorry to borrow from another franchise, the Moss Eisley of characters. And so I kind of went, you know, hand solo and Tatooine on this. Uh -huh. And a couple of the values kind of reflected that. For instance, I put, you know, the best way to buy yourself some time is by making something explode. That's a value. Maybe it's like, hey, when you need to get out of it, you do whatever you can. Or getting stabbed in the back teaches you how far you can reach. You know, I try to get a little, a little bit more darker on those or even 
imagine an extreme viewpoint like the federation is as temporary as the insert dead civilization here you know mm-hmm. so these characters are way more cynical um way more pragmatic and maybe have they have to handle things and they're not big on diplomacy many yeah. times so this is this is really i'm inviting players who maybe aren't super confident in their Starfleet canon or their Klingon canon, but you still want to play with what I think is one of the best game systems out there, the D20 game system. This is where you can really let loose and do your firefly if you want to get that out of your system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then that wraps up the chapter. So that's, uh, yeah. that's chapter three for the, for the player's guide. Yep. I, I read it and reread it and reread it. It's super fun. And players, um, I encourage game masters to hand, once you've decided on the campaign, hand this to your players to read these, these sections and as players keep this guide handy for uh, a bunch of ideas. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. So this is the great uh, first introduction to the player's guide. We're going to be talking uh, next time, Jim, about how to maximize your player experience and how to be the best player. So you, everybody wants a great game master, mm-hmm. but that's only as good as the players that sit around the table who also yep. follow some rules. So we're going to talk about that next time. Um, let me go ahead and give some shout outs right before I have you close out the session. Um, one of the traditions we like to do here at Continuing Conversations is to shout out the brick and mortar uh, stores. And today I got a really good response on Facebook when I asked for some shout outs. I'm going to take mm-hmm. it as far away from where I'm at in San Francisco, California, uh, the Bay Area, California. And I'm going to take it all the way to a store in Okayama, Japan. Okay. And, and it's Boardwalk in Okayama, Japan. And um, the, the person who wrote this in says they live over 700 kilometers away, but they always drop in when they visit Okiyama. It's run by a really great guy who is hardworking and so inviting to everyone in the hobby. So wow. go uh, Okinawa, right? <laughs> Brilliant. I love I it. I love the it. furthest shout out we've ever had. So hopefully That's... he sees this and, and hit us up on Facebook or wherever and, and uh, yeah. start joining our uh, Star Trek Adventures Facebook group because we'd love to hear more from you over at Boardwalk. All right, cool. All right. And Jim, All right, Michael. Well, thank you so much. As always, this has been a pleasure. Looking forward to the next one. We got we got more of these to more of these, more of these to record, but uh, we got plenty of books to talk about, including the player's guide. So uh, 